So just a quick bit on the Patient self determine Act. It requires, this is by legislation across the whole country, hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, home care, well, all, everyone has to actually have one. They are that those that are sorry receiving Medicare and Medicaid. So Medicare is for people over 65 um, who are disabled with chronic illness and so on. Um, but they also have to top that up by about 20%. Um, Medicaid is for low income people, uh, socially economically deprived and pregnancy and blind people blind and other sort of disabled uh, disabilities and also nursing home care. And sometimes they, they can be duly eligible for that. So what these, these um, the, the um, Patient self determine Act says that they must advise patients on admission of their right to adopt or refuse medical care. So I suppose I'm saying this because this is, if, if you're going to get a model here, you're going to maybe legislate for it and say, you have to do it. You have to have this conversation regardless. Advise patients that it's their right to execute an AD, they still keep calling them those there. Document whether a patient has one, implement the policies related depending on the area or the state, educate staff and communicate about ADs, and in the case of managed care organisations, they must be done individually. So it's, it's le in legislation, it's, it's law, it has to be done. What is interesting is what the research has to say about it. So, so they, the legislation was in the 90s, uh, in a, ma mass, a major study was done called Support, which actually I have to read, it's called Support and, and under, support to Understand Prognosis and Preferences for Outcomes and Risk of Treatment. And that was conducted in 1995 following the uh, ADs being leg legislation. And what they found is that, um, well, the argument was that they preceded, the ADs preceded any evidence that they were going to be effective. So they were often not completed, although the boxes were ticked. They didn't make it to a medical record if they were often, um, and they didn't appear to influence medical care. And even though after the support there was an increase up to th uh, from six to thirty-five percent in the medical records, it didn't. It wasn't associated with any actual changes in the care and, and hospital practices. So, so and the new research has, has showed that continuously. It had, didn't make any difference to how they were the care was managed. This is in acute hospitals because there's a different story going on in care homes and also the community. Uh, there is, um, and, and Kerry mentioned the fact that there, when there's an ACP in place or an advanced directive in place, the chances are people are less likely to get hospitalised. So those decisions are made and so they will get to stay home. And there is some studies now showing that in the US as well. So it is about having them early, it's about having them at home, and it's about people acting on them. But once they get into hospital with them, well, apparently you may as well not even take them. So, so that's something to consider when you're setting them up. And I, it's a bit of a jump here, but I just want to talk about capacity in surrogates. And I'm obviously particularly interested in this because of dementia. But um, the UK has a Mental Capacity Act uh, that is quite significant. And you can download that on the website. I'll show you later. And a lot of documents that go around uh, that, that are sort of helpful in, in working your way through the Mental Capacity Act. And it's an essential document when anyone's um, talking about getting an ACP in place. And it, it asks, it, it's important that, or the question it asks in relation to capacity is does the person have an impairment that actually will make a difference to having a, a coherent discussion about their advanced care plan or about how they'd like their care to be managed. And I think New Zealand, I haven't had a chance to look properly, but you've got something like a health and safety document that talks about capacity. Someone else might be able to answer that later. So, um, sorry, I should have showed you that slide. <laughs> I'm reading off here, but I didn't put it up. So that's, that was what I was just saying, that as, as, does a person have an impairment? And this impairment, impairment can be actually acute confusion, like delirium. But it also can be um, someone with a stroke who can't communicate, but actually can understand what you're saying to them. Or even in locked-in syndrome, which is, you know, often can go with, with different types of stroke. And also in learning disabilities. And I have to say, the research around learning disabilities is really very lacking 
and it's not, it's not great. There is a lot of research around capacity and dementia, mostly, well, pretty well all the um, US, except I'll mention Elizabeth Sampson's study in a little while. So capacity means that the person well, is unable to make a decision if she can't do the following things. And, that, and, and it's pretty you know, self-explanatory that they can't, don't understand what it is they're being asked, they can't retain it long enough to make the decision um, or use that information, and they can't communicate their, their actual um, wishes uh, in any way that anyone can actually clearly know. And I suppose that's why um, around dementia and, and early, di not even necessarily early diagnosis, just ageing and early confusing, uh, confusion changes that aren't necessarily um, dementia related, that the conversations have taken place. So families and the, the entourage know um, what it is this person would like. And I'll go on to say why it's a problem for surrogates if they don't, they don't know. Uh, and that's why they say you should carefully suggest, select your surrogate. Don't just have anybody. You know, have someone you really trust and you really do know will actually tell you, will, 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 will act on your behalf in exactly the way you would like them to. Um, and it, because um, they're expected to be able to decipher what the patient wanted, and if they haven't had the conversation, they, they just can't do it. So Elizabeth Sampson's study looked at advanced care planning for severe dementia, and she managed to recruit 100 people, in acute, this was in acute units, who were eligible, this was a family member, eligible to actually get the family member to make an advanced care plan and make a decision about how they would manage the care as the person with dementia came closer to death. They only managed to get seven out of 100. Um, she doesn't even know why there was a large dropout rate, but there's a lot of speculation in relation to the, the, um, the partners of very old, frail people with dementia can often be very distressed and bereaved and maybe even a little bit confused as well. But certainly distress, you, you become disorientated with distress and confusion and bereavement anyway. So, so there was this question, um, what, well, she really couldn't actually do it, and it was a randomised control trial system she was using. So the idea was, what, what she was saying is that it's so complex and, and very difficult to actually um, be able to, to get the surrogate decision-making and surrogate uh, knowledge in place for that particular group, unless you start very early. And what, again, I'm just coming back to the support study, what the data did show, and has been further confirmed in other studies, is that actually when... Um, the surrogate's understanding of the patient's preferences were only slightly better than chance when they were asked. So that's interesting itself. That means you really choose surrogate well. And even if you haven't, because they're bereaved and they're going to lose you, they, they, they don't necessarily act in your best interest. They act according to what they might like or what you know, they're feeling like at the time. And also, um, they've really actually, even, even when they've had the discussion and there's an AD in place, they don't necessarily accurately um, make decisions in relation to that, which is what the research has shown. So it's, it's quite interesting, I think, in itself. Um, and the reasons, I've just mentioned a couple, but they underestimate the patient's um, desire for less aggressive care, and they actually, they're influenced so much by their own values. Um, they are not prepared, they don't, they, they are also, the other thing in relation to dementia is that people don't actually understand what might be happening with the dementia um, illness progress and they're not expecting it to actually end in death that quickly or um, even that it might, even that it will, they don't sort of understand the process so that can be, be very difficult for them and as I've said they can often be very anxious and depressed. So just galloping on, this is the list of um, documents I've got on the table here. I'm going to leave them, but you can download them um, for copies. But, but overall, there were, there were three or the four sort of um, <coughs> things that an ACP should, should capture. It should, it should capture the person's concerned about their future care. What are their concerns? What are they? I mean, do they you know, wanted to go on a mountain and be eaten by a vulture because the, their body, you know, what do they want done with their body? It's more than just, um, just how it might be managed, pain relief and symptom management and so on. It's other things, those conversations about where you might be, want to be buried and so on. Um, they should ex be able to express um, their concerns about future care and whether they are afraid of 
dying with pain or whether they're uh, Buddhist and have no want to go out clear-headed. You know, there's a lot of quite important things around um, cultural ethnicity and so on in relation to what people might actually prefer in relation to uh, how that those last part of their life might be managed. Um, you know, they, they need to, the ACP needs to actually indicate that they understand their illness and what his prognosis is. So you're actually having a conversation that's, that's mutually understood. You both know what, you both talk, what each other is talking about. And that the preferences for type of care um, that they might want that will benefit them. So the kind of things that, we've, that have already been sort of talked about in the gold standard framework, but they're the sort of four main key conversations or key areas within the conversation that need to be had. How am I doing for time? I'm fine. You have okay. five minutes or more? Five? Oh, God. Okay, just a quick one. I won't go over this then. This is how, how the NHS is free. <laughs> um, and uh, Kerry sort of talked about that a bit. I won't go on to that. I did want to just talk quickly about this one. Um, she, she showed it in a different sort of way, but the end-of-life care strategy is sort of surrounded by these, these uh, five sort of packages, if you like, and gold standards as part of that. And, and there's been a lot of changes, that, like the, the rollout of the preferred priorities of care was prior to the end-of-life care pathway and so on. Um, so the end-of-life care pathway is actually where the ACP really sits, and I'm not going to go in detail because on that because Kerry did mention that, but advanced communication skills training. Uh, I'm actually a, an advanced commun communication skills trainer, you wouldn't think so sometimes. Um, <laughs> and that is, is uh, for the National uh, Cancer Action Team and, and that's been quite a crucial part of the upskilling of people in relation to having these conversations about advanced care planning. So, so that was very much embedded in, into the um, way the pathway worked. And the um, the group that were educated, of course, with a cancer and palliative care group, but my take, because I'm much more, well, not much more, but I'm very interested in non-malignant disease, and so we were just starting to roll it out. I was, I was in the West Midlands the last two years um, with a, a dementia team, and um, we were just starting to roll them out in, with specialist people working with people with dementia, because it's a different conversation, a different group of people you're working with. I'm going to skip over those, because you've talked about that and I've only got five minutes, I'd better hurry. <laughs> so the Australian, I said I'd talk about Australia when I phone, talked to someone on the phone. Um, just quickly, because that got mentioned earlier as well, um, the, the Australian Medical Association recognised ACP. It's become very much, uh, very high on, on their political agenda there. Um, but again, um, what is happening is that they are finding that doctors, and doctors actually, um, are allowed to preserve their um, clinical judgment a in relation to an AD. So is that? Uh, we'll talk about that later, maybe. So, so I think that some um, and, and ethicists are writing on this quite a lot. In fact, there's quite a few uh, interesting ethical papers from out of Australia about this this sort of um, mis this um, imbalance and having an AD, but then doctors are allowed to sort of make the final decision. And I won't go that, into that in any detail either, because I'm much. I want to talk about some other things. <laughs> and the patient's journey. Uh, this is really. A, I think this is quite a nice um, piece of work that's going on in um, South Australia. And this is the uh, Respecting Patients' Choices program, and you can actually look that up in Australia in, on the web as well. And it's a group of nurses. In fact, I bought it. It's in the middle here, so you might want to have a look at that sometime. I'll let you let you go and look at these things yourself. <laughs> I'm supposed to talk about New Zealand <laughs> in this, and I, I really didn't actually know much. I saw that there was a consultation document out, uh, and I couldn't find the um, the result, but I understand that's coming. So that's why I couldn't find it. And then I've, in the palliative care newsletter, I saw there were some groups work going on in Auckland that um, work going on. So I wasn't really going to, that's already been said as much as you know more than I do about what's happening in New Zealand. 